Have either one of you ever been to Disney World? Not since no. I was about f- seven or eight years old. Hmm. <laughs> That's not surprising. I was just curious. I mean, like... No, that's a lie. I just remembered. I went... Me and my friend Debbie went... Wow, when I was about 25. She lives in Florida, so I went and visited her. She's like, let's go to Disney. So we drove for, like, the day. Completely forgot about that. Well, and we didn't go on any rides. We just walked around. Wow, that's an expensive walk around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just we just. <laughs> I mean, back the, then it was probably a lot cheaper, but <laughs> yeah, but no, no. So I, I it's, it seems it seems like a, a a lot of work for a vacation. I don't know how you guys would ever be in the situation to go, and I, I know that neither one of you probably would ever do it on your own volition. But and it's it's overwhelming from the amount of people and the amount of stimuli that's just around you all the time. But if you ever find yourself in the area. And you just want to get some, like, creative... You know, you talk about doing your walks and you, like, take in creative stuff. If you were to go to Disney World, maybe even, like, some sort of tour or something, and just walk around and look at the details in this massive county of creativity, you would walk away with so much stuff in your brain. Because it is... You know, a big picture, you look at the whole thing, it's noise, it's loud, it's bright, it's food, it's cost, it's it's that. And then you zoom into, why did they put this thing right here? Oh, it's because they want to direct people subtly to do this. Or they want to make you stand in this perspective and look at that mountain and it seems bigger than it actually is. Because, you know, it's stuff like that. Everywhere. It's pretty unbelievable i was in disney this week in case you didn't, <laughs> were you now didn't, <laughs> didn't catch that um yeah we went uh, spring break went to my oldest is uh, in the marching band and so they got to march through magic kingdom oh that's cool and so we took a yeah took a school trip down and you know the family just went it's a cheaper way for us to go so the whole family went and we just had gosh how many days i don't know a bunch of days in the parks went to all the parks went to universal and stood in lots of lines, but had a blast, had a really good time together, and yeah. And like I said, they, I don't know how you guys would ever end up in that situation. You if, know, if they hired me to accord. do a YouTube, if they hired me to do a YouTube video about Disneyland, I would do it. <laughs> but it's it is that's not happening though at this point. It is here. really really fascinating to see the amount of effort that goes into the simplest things down there. I do Even remember. Like, Good. When I was a child, I do remember, and I'm thinking about it now as you're talking about it. When I was a young child, maybe seven or eight years old, we we had a family trip down there. And we stayed at a brand new hotel. And I remember thinking to myself, this hotel is dedicated to that park. Like the magnitude of like this place. Yeah. So many people come here. I had the wherewithal. I must have been like closer to 10 years old. I had the wherewithal to realize like this park is such a massive place that it has its own hotel. To ha- and it probably has 20 hotels now. Ah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I do remember walking or walking around, and my cousins who lived down there, they were saying, there's a secret underground to run the park. And we would see lights between tracks of some of the rides, and my cousins would be like, that's the underground. That's where the people who run the park live down there. So the yeah. magnitude of the... <laughs> live down there. <laughs> the complexity of the whole place really was, was not lost on me, and the amount of design and energy and obviously... It's it's a huge undertaking. It always has been, and always in. But just experiencing it as a child, who ultimately became a designer and an artist, it, the impact of that trip still resonates with me. Hmm. So. At the very least, you guys could watch on. I've talked about this before years ago on uh, Disney Plus. There's an, a series. It's it's called Imagineering or something about the Imagineers, and it's about that team of people that originally made Disneyland and then how they ended up making Disney world and all the stuff that they went through creatively to not all the stuff, a lot of stuff that they went through to build these rides and create this park and all this stuff. And it's a really fascinating look at how much thought went into all that, but they do talk about the underground city thing a little bit. Basically Florida is so low at sea level that they they couldn't they bought a county's worth of like 400 square miles or something i don't remember exactly how much it is a lot of square miles of land secretly and then they went to build this park they built all these shell companies to buy land from all yeah. these people so nobody knew that they were buying it all at one time 
and then they had this big mass of land, but it was swamp. And so then they built this city, you know, tunnel system, and then put dirt on it, and then built the park on top of that. So when you actually are in Magic Kingdom, you are at least a story up above the rest of the ground. You can't tell that. And so all of that tunnel system is how they take a lot of the trash out of the park so that you don't see people walking along with trash bags so much. You do a little bit. It, they have like a transportation, like a you know little cars and stuff down there so that they can get from one place to another. So if somebody gets lost, they go, an attendant will take them into the system and they get them to the place where they're safe very quickly. It's mm. It's wild. It's wild the amount of stuff that goes into that. And in that documentary, you can see a lot of it. But yeah, um, the just the thought and the care that goes into all the rides, even the rides, the ones that have been around since the seventies. Uh, there was this one we were on. Um, it's called Thunder Mountain, and it's like you're on this old thunder, you're, this old railroad track you know and there's like explosive stuff everywhere and it's like a camp where they're mining something and so as you're standing in line you're weaving through this old shack of a building that looks like it's on a mining camp and there's all this design everywhere that makes you see the names of like coal miner or not coal but you know miners and all this stuff and then there's this one area where you have this little crank and it's it's on the wall and it's looking out a window. And when you look out the window, you're looking at the ride. So it all looks like it's in California. It's rocks everywhere and this roller coaster's going around. And there's pools of water and stuff. And this crank, you, you crank it up and a little dial just goes over and hits this red area. And then when you do that, next to it, there's a, like a dynamite. A plunger box. <laughs> plunger, yeah, that's the thing. And there's a bunch of these along the ride. And so what you do, they don't tell you this, but what you do is you crank it up till it gets to red, and then you hit the plunger, and water will shoot up out of one of the pools that's out there. <laughs> they don't tell you about that. It's just you find little things like that that they built in to just immerse you and make it fun and pass the time, and and there's stuff like that everywhere. And it's like I was telling David before we started recording, my kids are now old enough that it's not a matter of like, oh, we got to go find a bathroom again. Oh, so and so wants snacks. Like they're cool, you know. <laughs> like we had fun together, <laughs> and we were walking around talking the whole time about, oh, did you see this little thing? Oh, did you notice this? And my kids were noticing things that I didn't see, and we had a really good time at Disney. A lot of fun. Nice. And I rode did, the Tron is, ride. Is which, Thunder Mountain? I, I want to ask you, is Thunder Mountain based on a movie, isn't it? Like an old Disney movie. It might, you not might not. It, it's of. so irrelevant anymore because I do remember that uh, seeing that ride, and I do remember. I think it has something to do with a movie called Thunder Mountain. The, it, there could be. I don't know. Yeah, but about it's so it. well. It's from the seventies. Yeah. Now they probably realize the ride is. More I know there's Splash than Mountain, it. which was based on like the Br'er Rabbit, Br'er Fox, mm -hmm. Song of the South stuff, which they've like blacked out from history. Yeah. Um, you know, it's completely removed from all of their everything, and they're redoing mm -hmm. that ride, so they're even yeah. taking out the remnants of it. But. Um, there, there's a Tron ride there, and <clears throat> Tron's yeah, a movie from the early '80s. Jimmy, I, I, remember, I remember. I remember the video game. All my friends wanted to play the the coin slot game. Oh yeah. yeah. So they built this light cycle ride, and in the movie, you, you know, the, the characters are in the computer, and so they're driving these like motorcycles that leave like a beam of light behind them. It's real iconic. And then a few years ago, they like ten years ago, they came out with a sequel to it. So it's all modernized. It's even more neon-y and bright and you know and the art direction of that movie is also pretty fascinating because everything is black and neon so it's black suits and blue glowing stuff or black suits and yellow glowing stuff it's real the contrast is real high and so they built this ride that follows that aesthetic and so when you go in there everything looks like it is straight out of the movie Hmm. And the canopy that covers the entire entrance to the walkway is covered with LED stuff that you can't see until it lights up. So there's these big waves of light and just an amazing structure. And then we get inside this, you're in a black room with edge lit acrylic everywhere that is animated and screens behind things to add all this depth. And like, it was really immersive. Now I'm a big Tron fan, like right behind Star Wars. I'm a big Tron fan. And so I walked into this room and just kind of was like, whoa. 
like this is awesome and it really it's been a while since i've been in a, a place like that like a complete setting that it inspired me like i and it's you know it's something i like so i'm drawn to it but i was like i have to use this i have this is this is amazing somebody went to leaps and bounds to make this right to match the the art direction of this movie and yeah it just really hit me so i don't know what it is yet i might know what it is but something soon is going to come out of that that immersive work that somebody else did you know to make that ride what it was so anyway it's it's really it's really important that as artists we see other art it's really the yeah. one thing that's I said it in my my TEDx talk that I did many years ago now. you got to see so much stuff. It all just comes into your brain. Even if it's not specifically art, but just interesting things that inspire you. You have to see so much of it because then it regurgitates its way somehow. It goes through the mushmash of your artificial intelligence, in air quotes, of your brain. And then gets spit out later. <laughs> as, as it, would that be considered real yeah. intelligence? Like your, your brain's <laughs> machine learning. Yeah. So you went to you visited an art studio recently. I haven't oh, heard yeah. about this yet. Yes, yes. Rachel, my girlfriend, is a uh, she's a, an art dealer. She she's also an art consultant, which is a little bit I'm learning is a little bit more specific. An art consultant is somebody that comes to your house and decides what type of art you're looking for, helps you decide what to look for, and 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 she says, unfortunately, there's a lot of filling this empty space. I want to fill this empty space architecturally approach an architectural approach versus a real uh heart and soul approach so she tries to balance that with her clients and she placed a piece of frank stella's art with uh with a client of hers and she now has access to frank stella you can look up frank stella if you don't know him he's 80 87 years old he wasn't at the studio this was my my birthday we she brought me in to visit with uh with his with his people and he has Guys just like us that make a lot of his art now. He makes maquettes and he does some work on the computer. He'll design things on the computer. And his work is extremely free-flowing. It's extremely abstract. He makes big, giant public sculptures at this point in his life. Obviously some private work, small stuff, big stuff. But it seems the majority of his work at this point in his career is all huge public art. So Rachel said, you have to come and look. So she dragged me over there to see it. She didn't have to drag me, by the way. I, I was, <laughs> yeah, I was went willingly. Say, hmm. I went willingly. And he experiments with all types of materials. He's been making art. In fact, to put it in perspective, how much experience he has, we were just looking him up a little bit the night before. She's done. She obviously knows him and has done tons of research on him. And she found a quote. And I, I don't remember the quote specifically. It more pertained to the conversation we were having. But he made this quote while he was... Actually, as I recall, it was a quote about seeing art. But that quote was from 1960 when he was teaching at Pratt. So that's how far back oh. this gentleman goes. So he, wow. he has a, an amazing career. My experience with Frank Stella personally was in the 80s. I worked for a construction company, and they had a few contracts in the city. While I was working at, while I was teaching, while I was a student at the School of Visual Arts, I worked for this construction company that would hire me randomly from time to time when they had jobs. And one of the jobs we had was painting the walls in the Nodler Gallery. So this is in 1986, 87. I was working with a group of painters and we were painting the walls inside the Nodler Gallery, which was a gallery that handled Frank Stella, Salvador Dali, and several other artists. And I got to see all this work up close. And like, I didn't, I wasn't an art handler, so I didn't move it, but I got to intimately look at it when between, between open hours. And we were painting the various galleries and the, it was in a beautiful old building. It wasn't necessarily sort of like a industrialized storefront, but so we had to paint the incidental spots too. We weren't painting only the galleries; we were painting the in-between spots in the building. It was more like a previously it used to be a home, and now it's but a very, very wealthy home from like one of the big bankers in the in the 1900s, and now it's this gallery. And so that was my first experience with Frank Stella's art, seeing it up close. That was when they handled mostly paintings of his. Now it's all sculpture big giant sculptures and his work is it's like a controlled chaos his later works the works that he's doing now and he has a bunch of guys like me that work there and spray paint and do welding and plasma cutting they have all the tools it's crazy it's in an old air it's in an, it looks like an airplane hangar 
there's overhead cranes everywhere. And they, they, he bought the building 30 years ago. It's probably 75,000 square feet warehouse. And there's randomly, there's cars, cool cars everywhere. There's a, there's a Formula One car up on a shelf, like a real Formula One car. It's just insane. And there's maquettes everywhere because that's how he makes his art now. He makes the maquette. Oh, cool. And then you'll see a maquette. And then you'll see all the influence around that maquette sitting on the table, toys and such. And then as you walk through, you go through these different walled off places. And there it is. There's the manifestation of that maquette that's sitting on a table of, near, his, near his coffee maker. It's crazy. And, and his, uh, his guy who was showing us around is like, oh, that maquette was made in 1985. And it looks like it was placed there last week. So he keeps wow. all this old artwork around him all the time. These things that inspire him. And then they manifest in these tremendous pieces. And there was all these pieces getting ready to be shipped. He's like, oh, this is going to Singapore. This is for the college such and such in Europe. And this, all these giant pieces everywhere getting ready to be created. And there was lots of crates too. These, they have a very specific way of creating <coughs> with planks so the whole crate is made out of planks it's the way they want to do it crazy it's, a, it's like a huge idea factory for abstract art wow so yeah it was great it was just let you know that these types of this type of this type of work is possible you know and Rachel's been encouraging me to do more abstract work and I've talked about it here and yeah so it was great cool that was my birthday, April 3rd. Yeah. Happy great. late birthday. Thank we you. I sent you guys some recording. pictures of his stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. In Newburgh. He's in Newburgh. So if you live in the New York area and you're driving around Newburgh and you see this giant airplane hangar with this crazy abstract art outside and also across the street, there's a big empty public land across the street. It was, wasn't being used for anything. So he and his crew placed several giant sculptures there. In waiting to be placed somewhere in the world and the town asked him to to remove them in time so he removed them he lost those little court battle and then they removed them and then the town had such an uproar that people wanted the art back oh, and wow. so he moved it across the street and then he moved it back across the street and I say him I mean his name is on it but yeah. these pieces needed they need cranes and crews to move them they're tremendous so, anyway, wow. so a lot of people in Newburgh probably driving around wondering what's going on there. If you don't already know, it's Frank Stella's art studio. I um, I'm so blown away by established artists and the infrastructure around them. So, like I've watched this thing on um, Jeff Koons, and I've watched a couple documentaries on Daniel Arsom. I think that's how you say his name, and you think of them as a single person because they're they're just a name but then when you see like their studio tour there's like a team of a hundred people working for them doing all of the stuff and there's all there's like 20 pieces that that are all being worked on at the same time by the artists by the people helping the artists and things being shipped and it's such a a weird business i have this like complete disconnect from understanding how you actually make a living as a as a famous artist i don't I, have you <sighs> yeah i so i think we've talked about this before but i've got two friends who used to work for jeff coons and they lived in new york and were painters for him and they're both incredible artists on their own like unbelievable you know and they worked for him and just painted detail. Like a lot of his paintings are these like massive paintings with tons of detail. And so they would paint in, they would get kind of a rough idea or a sketch or something like that. And then they would go in and do this detail work at this really, really large scale. And something about that bothers me. And I know that there's argument for it or against it about whose work that actually is and I, whatever, but knowing the person and how talented they are and then they're doing this work that someone else is getting kind of credit for as their art mm -hmm. like, I don't know, something about that doesn't sit well with me i think it, it feels has, like it should be a collective or it, something yeah. I, don't, I don't know it's almost like um 
and it does this doesn't bother me much anymore but when i was younger and i i didn't like artists who just went by their name for example tom petty or bruce springsteen because i knew there were so many huh. other people involved in that music yeah and it, it it just seemed so so weird and then when you um and i don't know any actual facts but i'm just pulling this out of out of thin air but when you think of somebody like britney spears i just assume there's a team of right britney <laughs> spears is so not in right now but um it's the only <laughs> name i can think of but when i think of britney spears i think of like there's a team of writers working on these songs to make hits and it's more than than just this name and i don't know it doesn't really bother me that much anymore but he, but it used to when i was younger well, I think when it, when it comes to a huge artist, it, for instance, Picasso or even Frank Stella or uh, Richard Serra just died. Richard Serra does the big metal sculpture. He just passed away. And when you look at a Richard Serra, it's this 20-ton piece of sheet metal that's three inches thick. It's a giant chunk of steel that has like a subtle curve in it. And you think to yourself, what did he actually do? But he put in so many years of shop work and, and exploration to get to a point where his vision got bigger than his hands and a lot of these artists is that you put in a, a, a career a lifetime career your your vision becomes bigger than you and mm -hmm. and i think we all know and I'm not saying it's right or it's wrong when the ashes fall after the next nuclear fallout people are only going to remember the work for the person who thought of it not for the hundred people that put it together mm. and that I think is a lifetime of work in the shop, in the field, putting together your vision. And then when your vision becomes bigger than your hands, you need help. And then you get help, and that's when you have young, up, coming, up and coming artists. And, and and I think it's sort of like it's like a little bit of the uh, <clears throat> it's almost like the dirty underbelly of being a fine artist is you have these studio assistants that help you create your vision, and they're passing through their career trajectory to get to a point where they can also have visions bigger than their hands. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a little icky sticky because you have people that, yeah, and we talked a little bit about this before the thing started, whereas somebody might say, oh, you know, it'd be cool. It'd be cool if you make it purple. And all of a sudden it's like, Jeff Koons was very genius. He decided to make this purple. What a great thought. Even meanwhile, it was one of his studio assistants that maybe made it through the muck and the mire to get his vision out there. And then that person is the only person who could say to his friends and family, I was the one who thought of making a purple. <laughs> and then you you use that confidence to build your own career. So Very, like I said, it's it's a little it's a little it's a little uh like I said, it's a dirty underbelly of yeah. of I think in a know. very selfish way, I prefer this is a terrible, absolutely terrible thing to say. I, I realize that. But <laughs> I, I I really want my artists that I love to be tortured alone in a room making that mm -hmm. thing that they want to make. Like, I, I don't know how to explain exactly how I feel about it, but I, I, I want this to be like, I want their art to be so meaningful to them to come out of pain or, or, or happiness. But really, what we create is so much bigger than that, right? Yeah. I just I, I just grew up in the in the early 90s nirvana was my favorite band of all time like any i i read and watched every single thing nirvana yeah. and then like i so i just i kind of attached myself to that tortured artist making mm -hmm. art for yeah. themselves who can't handle the the the, the society the pressure. yeah <laughs> yeah. But then that also, we, we, we're getting into the weeds here with the conversation, which is actually pretty good. The idea of having studio assistants versus having AI versus having CNC machines. Hmm. So CNC machines are new studio assistants, at least in our community, where people go, oh, you didn't make that. You did that. And, and I, I'm a bit of a firm believer in the idea that... See how confident I am? I'm a bit of a firm believer. I'm a firm, <laughs> I'm a firm believer. I'm nervous. I'm a firm believer in the idea that if you can think of it and you can direct it, it took me time to get to that. I didn't always believe yeah. it. But mm -hmm. when you see producers and directors getting awards, and even Derek had this realization. He says, I used to watch producers and directors get awards at award shows and be like, they're not, that's not Marlon Brando. That's not Robert De Niro. They're the ones that made this. What are they doing? You realize that they're just brushes in their canvas, really. 
mm. the producers and the directors who didn't do the acting and you know, maybe in some cases didn't write the screenplay, but they're walking away with the Oscar because it was their vision, it was their... And then when we look back at our experience with our TV show and we, every one of us constantly says it, the reason our Making Fun show is what it was is specifically because of Mike O'Dare, the guy who put the whole concept together and had a vision and put together all these different pieces of of his personal experience together to make what we made. Obviously, we had a part in it, and a lot of the creative imagery was really brought up by us as the as the makers. But Mike put the fun and the and the edits together. So it's it's made by hand or made by mind. I think it's I think they're they're the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can I can accept it, that a lot more now than in my younger yeah. days. Yeah, no. When I was an artist, and I was like. <clears throat> I remember like thinking, Jeff Koontz has studio assistants that do this stuff. He always wears a suit. He's never gets dirty. He's not one of these artists you see struggling with like dirty pants on. <laughs> like, hmm, that's interesting. Right. Yeah. And then to come to the the realization of what that actually really means and But at some point he probably was, right? I don't know anything about his past, but yeah. I would assume that at some point he was the one coming up with ideas and painting them and it trying to figure out how to sell it and you know that type of stuff like my friend actually did work for him as well my friend did some uh, casting for him early on he was making like small like balloon animals for him and he he gave me a little bit of a history which in i could be totally wrong because this is 25 years ago in my recollection he was always more of a, a producer and less of an hmm. actual physical maker i could be totally wrong there but we can look it up yeah um, I'm going to shout out my friend Matt, who is one of the people that I was talking about because he is an amazing artist. And you're talking about somebody who, like, gets dirty. Uh, his name's Matt Bober, and I'm going to put a link in the show notes to his studio show that is up right now. When you look at these paintings, here, I'll send you guys a link to it. <clears throat> uh, you look at these paintings, and... They look very, very realistic. The thing that doesn't translate when you're looking at these images is the size of the images in real life. And if you go, if you go over some of them, you can see them in frames on a brick wall. And then you see the scale of the picture. And then when you think about the detail at that scale, they're small. They're small paintings. But when you look at the amount of detail in them at the scale that they were painted, it is unbelievable. And we've hung out with him a lot um, in their house, in their studio. And, you know, he's described how he goes about painting these things. And it's all from reference. He he goes around and he buys all these, like, creepy old toys and just strange things. And he sets up still lifes that would never exist otherwise. And then he'll, he'll paint them. And I, they're unbelievable. They're unbelievable paintings. So, anyway give him a shout out because he used to work he and his girlfriend both used to work for um, Jeff Koons well, I think it's also important though these, these studio assistants it's really important as a an artist that has a burning desire to do that large scale art it's really important this, <laughs> the studio assistant system is there so that you could get an up close and personal look and see how that works versus just I'm going to always only do my own thing. I'm never going to work mm. for another artist. And then you're sort of an outsider. How are you going to break into the system? You could you could be working at a at a big studio, for instance, like Jeff Koontz, and then meet any number of people that are extremely wealthy and famous, and ha and you you could develop access through any of these people. <clears throat> being up close. Oh, and I'm sure that being a studio assistant is a learning experience as well. Yeah. Like I, I would guarantee they all walk out with more skills than they went in with. Yeah. yeah. And then, like I said, not necessarily just for the art and the technical know-how, but the getting access to the people who would buy your art and knowing who right. those people are, what foundations are the foundations that spend money, how you get a college to buy a giant sculpture to put in their thing. I'm not saying I know any of this stuff, but I just know that being in that world is how you get access. Being a studio assistant is how you get access to these hmm. I remember personally my experience. I met Richard Avedon when I was a student at the School of Visual Arts. I had I, I made this wooden box, and my teacher at the time worked for, with Richard Avedon on the Revlon ads. She this is in the eighties, and my teacher, her name was Yolanda Cuomo, 
she was she designs and makes books. I think she's still working in the city. And she was working on the Revlon ads at the time and her and Richard Avedon picked Cindy Crawford to be the model in the Revlon ads. Well maybe I don't know. Anyway, she would do the she would do the Revlon ads. Cindy Crawford was the model who was, you know, twenty years old at the time. And Richard Avedon was the photographer. And I brought in this box and my teacher was so impressed with this box. She's like, I'm working on a project with Richard Avedon. Can you meet me at his studio today and bring the box? I was like, sure. So we, I met at Richard Avedon's studio, which was up the Upper East Side. He was there, sat down with him. And he had like 20 assistants bringing us everything. Can I get your coffee? Can I get you? And they were all fluttering on the ground. Like it was, it was like a thing. It was like a scene in a fashion movie. 10 people came up to him while we were talking for about 30 minutes. <clears throat> we were sitting at a table. Uh, we're going to use Ilford 400. Oh, that's great. We're going to do this. He didn't seem to have one stress in the world. Mm. Everybody else around him was like sucking up all the stress and being stressful. <laughs> we're getting ready. What do you? What camera do you want to use? Like, oh, let's use the Hasenblatt. Like he would just like answer every question real casual and chill. He was he was very very nice, and uh, it was it was a pretty incredible meeting. But that was really the first time I was in my second year art school, hanging out at Richard Avedon's studio, seeing all these assistants he had, doing all the dirty work, but he had a career to get to that point you know it was he had lived a right. lifetime of a career he was extremely famous at that point and then i and then about three years later i saw him doing a photo shoot in my neighborhood right outside my building and i walked over to him and i said hello and he remembered me he was also very nice again and uh he was he was photographing and it was even funny i remember that day it was a cold day he was standing there he had like 10 assistants around him a couple of models in and out of some model truck that was nearby and he was standing there with his hands in his pocket and I don't remember seeing him take a picture. He was just there as the director telling hmm. whoever was pushing the button what to do. And he was directing the models. It was a cold day. He was wearing a, like a, a coat in his hands and everybody was cold. And his hands were in his pockets. He wasn't holding a camera. But it takes a lifetime to get to that point. Yeah. That idea of having being surrounded by that many employees that are making, or not making decisions, but are executing. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. And being unstressed about that that seems really foreign to me because i feel like that would be like you have to be really successful i think for that scenario to not be stressful yeah that yeah. seems like a very stressful you know a lot of moving parts and a lot of that's I, that's responsibility why i, I try not like to have too many people around people. me i mean i yeah. did have people around me when i had my toy my toy production company with my brother but it is stressful managing personalities it takes away the fun in making art which mm. is why I keep, you know, I keep it lean and mean. I try to. Lean and mean. <laughs> um, David, we never heard from you, like, what you were doing this week. You didn't go to Disney World, I know that. I did not go to Disney World, no. Uh, this week we are, uh, we're just making something really, really simple. We're doing, uh, we're making a medicine cabinet for the other house, for the rental house. And um, we discussed this a few weeks ago and trying to figure out what, uh, what's the hook, what's the, why would, and we we're hidden storage, blah, blah, blah. And I just decided, you know what, I just want to, I just want to make a dang medicine cabinet. That's real stupid simple. <laughs> and so that's what I'm doing. Um, that's the one that's going to have the, the secret uh, entrance into a Netherland. Right, right. Open the other direction. Right. That'll be part two of the video. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I I just came to the realization like sometimes you just got to make something that doesn't have any hurdles. It doesn't have to have a hook. It does. It just I just need to make something that needs to be there, and I'm going to make a video about it. So I'm not, I'm not uh, I'm not going to stress out about trying to get a million views on this video. I got other but things to stress out about, like making the stupid finish that I've been. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, how's that the going? Packaging looks beautiful, by the well, way. You posted the picture yesterday, right? About the packaging. It does. Yeah, I, uh, I, I can make them in batches of basically twenty four, twenty five kits at a time, and uh, it is, it's it's a lot of work. <laughs> I am I am, uh, it it. <sighs> Watch it be your most successful endeavor. Well, yeah. It turned into a whole thing of like, it's not easy to ship. 
So because yeah, it has volatile hazardous chemicals, ma- yeah, it has hazardous supposedly. materials in there, ethanol. So had to go through this whole thing of uh, people were telling me I needed to be hazmat certified. So I found this course for 150 bucks, and and then it has to be packaged in a certain way. The original, uh, the, it was originally going to be packaged in a glass whiskey bottle. And this all started when I took some finish that I've been I've been using the Maker Brand finish uh, for the last couple of years for a lot of projects, and it comes in a can, and I can never see how much is in the can. So I poured that can into a Jim Beam empty Jim Beam bottle. Now I can always see how much is in there if it's skinned over on the top or whatever. And then over a couple of years, that Jim Beam bottle got really patina with all this dry finish on the end. And this, this, so this whiskey bottle looks amazing. And so I wanted to carry over that theme into this finish that I'm developing. And so I, I bought a whole bunch of glass bottles with corks and going with the whole whiskey theme. And then after uh, I didn't realize shipping was going to be so hard, uh, the bottle's too big to ship. And um It has to be under a certain amount of ounces, and the bottle was bigger than that. You can ship in greater quantities, but there has to be a metal container. And so, yeah. And so then I go, all right, I got to put it in a smaller 16 ounce container. And then I also had, it's like a cork cap, uh, like a friction fit cap. And you can't ship anything with, with ethanol that has a friction fit cap. It has to be a screw cap that turns at least one and a half times. There's all this other, I had to get some hazmat wow. labels and go through all this stuff to ship this. Uh, it's been, uh, it's been fun and I hate shipping. And so <clears throat> I didn't want to be a factory. I didn't want to make this public. So I made a video going over the all the ingredients that I use giving you the exact recipe encouraging people to make it themselves you guys convinced me I should I should try to sell it so I decided I'll sell it to just patreon members only I put up the uh, I put them up for sale last night at the first batch of 24 it sold out in 15 minutes (laughs) I have another batch (laughs) that I'm gonna put up next week Uh, another batch of 24 25 so good job um, congratulations i think that's awesome thank you the 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 funnest part of the whole thing was making the labels like i had a really good time it like brought me back to my graphic design days of going through they're very pretty i'm looking at them now they're very pretty uh, thank you very much yeah it looks great so um again i don't know how it's going to perform in other climates how what the shelf life is so we're just only patreon people can get it and then I'm just going to gather feedback over the next year. I've had a couple people reach out to me saying, you should look into so-and-so for manufacturing. We'll see. Hmm. We'll see where, where it takes me. Did you guys see that post this week? It reminds me because you said you were going to kind of make it confusingly similarly marketed like 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 bourbon. Mm-hmm. A woman showed a thing of her mother. There's this olive oil-based cosmetics company everything's based in olive oil and the mother bought it and thought it was real olive oil and she cooked the whole chicken dinner with shampoo that looks like an <laughs> olive oil bottle mm. oh, no. <laughs> that's unfortunate and then she, the daughter comes in and goes mom this is shampoo and there's a little tiny word on the but it says olive oil this olive oil that <laughs> natural olive oil and there's a little word on it that says shampoo oh. and the mother had no idea and, and then it shows the mother like cursing and being all annoyed after cooking this big beautiful dinner with shampoo oh. So that's that's why labels are very important. <laughs> yeah, I mean, did they try it? It might have been good. Yeah, it might. <laughs> I have that, and on that note, I have a pet peeve. I I need glasses, and when I take when I take a shower at a hotel bathroom, they have the new pump bottles now. Every bottle has every shower in every hotel has three pump bottles. One of them is conditioner, and I don't need conditioner because I'm bald. I need body <laughs> soap or I need shampoo. And every single time, I, I, it's like luck of the draw. It's like, is it the first one? That is not. That is that is not conditioner. Okay, let me go to the second one. That's conditioner. Usually, it's in the middle, but it's not always in the middle. Always in the because I can't read those three little words on those three right. bottles. I need to like take my glasses in the shower. You don't. Or, yeah, I was well, say, look, you don't shower with your glasses on. Come on, man. Or I always like I get in a hotel room and I'm like, see where the conditioner is, so you don't use it. Yeah. And I always forget <laughs> to till I'm in the shower and the shower's running. My glasses are up. 
That's my pet peeve. Packaging is important. Mm. Okay. Well, that is true. I well, see. I'm glad that it sold out, David, and yeah. and I understand that it may not be something you want to keep on, but I, I think that's really cool that you made something that at least that many people wanted yeah. immediately. Yeah. They knew it was coming, they were looking forward to it, and they... You know, I can tell you where cool. a lot of the stress comes from. As soon, when I announced in the, the YouTube video that I was only selling it to Patreon members at, at cost for testing purposes... I immediately, well, not immediately, but over the next week, I got like 25 new Patreon members. And that stress of like, oh my gosh, I'm a fraud. <laughs> These people are buying into this and it, it's not even proven. And then it sold Take out it you make it. in 15 minutes. And I was posting on my Discord and like imposter syndrome has totally kicked in. This stuff isn't even, it hasn't been thoroughly tested. What are you guys doing? And uh just makes me... Success makes well, me but, nervous. But yeah. they knew that, right? I mean, you're I really suppose, clear about I that. I suppose, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they're, you know, you can look at it. I totally get that feeling because I would feel the exact same way. But you can also look at it from the perspective of <clears throat> there's at least this number of people. There's a lot more than that. But there's at least this number of people who believe in my potential enough to help me test it. Mm -hmm. That's You know, it's not that they think you're the greatest thing ever, but they, they want to help you. Yeah. be what you actually are and that's very cool yeah yeah so, well good man I'm, I'm glad it's happening um jimmy you didn't mm. really say what you'd been working on i don't think. what did i work on i made the garden cart last week i'm calling it the utility cart i kept calling it the garden cart but it's more of a utility cart for around the around the yard and, and that was a fun video to make and the thing has been getting used quite a bit Today I'm going to use it a lot. We've been also working on the barn. I've been doing more Instagram stuff on the barn in the backyard. That's getting finished. That sat undone for a year. And now I'm putting a lot of time and energy into that. So there's going to be some videos coming out on the barn. And then a lot of people ask about the house, the graveyard house, which hasn't been worked on only because the winter has been pretty harsh. And where the house is, it's on a giant empty field that the wind comes whipping up. So to work there is impossible in the winter unless unless you're used to building on mount everest that's what it's like over there so the winter was just a harsh winter in that particular area so i am not i'm not going to work in the winter and now the spring is here i'm going to get the graveyard house i'm partially through the last video i was working on i realized i looked at the footage the other day starting to put that video together and the last day i worked at it was december 27th so a couple of days after Christmas was the last time I was over there working. So I, if you asked me in my my memory, I would have told you September, October. I didn't realize I worked on it that late in the season. Up here, January and February, are usually the two roughest winter months. So now that the spring has sprung, I'm going to work on all the projects all the time. <laughs> no pressure. Get it all done. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but my! Did you guys see my giant band? So showed up. Did you see that on Instagram? Did you happen to see yeah. that? It is so big. <laughs> it is so yes, big. It is. But it's not assembled yet. It came on a truck from from Georgia, and it's in pieces. And it is humongous. The casting for the the C frame for the bandsaw, just the casting itself is twenty five hundred pounds. Twenty twenty three hundred pounds. That's and crazy. then the wheels. It takes two four foot diameter wheels and the the table the table's probably two or three hundred pounds the cast the table so all that's going to slowly get start start to be assembled and uh keith rucker who did a over 50 video series on restoring that bandsaw he wants to come up and work with me putting it together so we just have to schedule a time i i want he he wants to and I want to afford him that opportunity. I mean, m my gut's like, ah, I got it. I'll figure it out. But he put so much tender love and care into that thing. And I, I want him to be comfortable with the way it's set up. But before he gets there, I have to build a platform for it. Because the wheel on the bottom of the saw goes through the floor. And I don't have a floor to put it on right now. Because all the rooms I would use it in are concrete. And I'm not ready to dig a hole in the concrete for the wheel. So in a factory setting in the 1880s when this bandsaw was set up, it would have been put in a 
on a situation where the hole would go through the concrete floor or the wooden floor. I thought about putting it in the in the graveyard house barn, but the we me and Rob looked at it and I'm afraid it might not be strong enough. Mm. You know, without some modification. Mm. Yeah. So, yep. That's uh I'm working on that and this week I might experiment with and, and I'm getting I'm not I'm not breaking the bank on views, but the positive feedback has been overwhelming. My so-called new video style where I'm showing more intimate problem solving and talking in the moment while I'm working on the design aspects and the problem solving aspects of it. People really responded to it and it's it's nice to see. It's a, the videos are a little bit more interactive with the audience in the in the, the comment section. So this week it's a simple video, but I want to use my bending break that I have. And I may or may not be ready for this weekend, but I'm because I haven't started yet. But it's a simple video. I could probably do it in two days, considering tomorrow and Friday. I'm going to design and make a metal stool. And I did it in the past. I did the Shaquille O'Neal stool, but that was based on a, an existing design. This is going to be more of a simple design. And for me, it's more about using the bending break and solving problems with this bending break that I have. And then hand hot rivets and stuff. So I, I kind of have a vision for this industrial style metal stool that will be made on the bending break. So I'm going to go through the process of showing that design process and then making the cutting paths for the torch mate table and then bending it on the this big giant metal bender that I have. So that's that's where I'm at for this week. And I showed a little bit of on my Patreon showing I made a little paper model of it. So they get to see that. Cool. Yeah. Talking about spring and it, you know, being warm enough to to work. Before I left for Florida, I went out and just spent a couple hours. It was like maybe an hour and a half at the farm. <clears throat> Had to go mow for the first time this season. And so I, while I was there, I just did a little bit of body filler stuff on the Gia. I'm like, man, I haven't touched this thing in so long. Like, you know, it's nice outside. And <laughs> I mixed up a wad of body filler. And as soon as I started mixing it together, I'm like, oh, this is why you do it in warm weather. It was totally different uh -huh. than <laughs> the the frozen icing that I was doing in the winter when I was trying to make that video. This was just like, you know, it was just like real yeah. fluid and buttery. And man, I have the, the two little areas that I coated in that hour that I was out there or whatever, just so much better. Hmm. Like fewer bubbles. It went on smoother. It just, yeah. yeah. So I'm glad I didn't waste the winter trying to do that over and over and over. But it was also really nice just to get back to it and do, you know, I worked on a small section. I didn't make a lot of progress. But um, now that it's warm enough and I'll be out there mowing and stuff on a regular basis for the next several months, I'm hoping to really make some progress on the body filler. Because I really want to get that part out of the way. I still the body have a lot itself. of metal work to do. Yeah, I still have a lot of metal work. I have to cut the entire back end bottom like under the trunk i have to cut that whole thing out and put in new panels on all that whoa and so yeah and that's going to be hard to get lined up and hard to figure out what to replace in what order so that i don't lose my reference points and all that stuff so the body filler just kind of feels like like i just need to get this done and get it out of the way so i can get on to the actual difficult work body fill is difficult but it's just more of the same um and I know it's just going to take me a long time. The thing I don't know <clears throat> about body filler is how do you know when it's enough? How do you know when it's it looks is going to look good? Because you're sanding a surface on top of another surface on top of primer, which is on top of metal. And so as you sand, you, it's mm -hmm. not like it got smooth and glossy. It just gets harder to look at. You got to look so at I it. Really with, don't know. You got to look at it down. My my experience with bondo is you could put bondo on a dent, sand it, and then you sand too much, and then when you paint it, you look back, you could see the edges of the dent in a yeah. very very light glare. So it's really yeah. important. If you guys have noticed, there's a lot of guys doing these dent repairs online, and they have these LED panels that only project lines. So when you put the the light, when you shine the light on a glossy surface, you see the LED lines reflected, and they'll change contours over dent. 
And th- now you're talking about a shiny car, right? Oh, car with the paint on yeah. it. So those yeah. LED lines will go in and out of the dent. So you see the topographic map of that dent. And as they remove it, these guys specialize in getting out dents in painted cars, which is obviously a whole art in and of itself without chipping the paint or cracking the paint. And it is incredible the work they can do. But I would imagine if you're going to do a car that is not painted, you might be able to wipe it with water, for instance, just to get it wet to see those same contours. But also just hit hit a body panel in the dark with a long shadow, turn the lights way down and just take a an Olight flashlight and shine it straight down the body panel. Lay the flashlight against the body panel, point it in the dent, and you'll be able to see shadows if you sanded too much Bondo or you haven't sanded enough. Yeah. You'll be able to see the, the contours. It's also why you need the longer sanding blocks. So you're not sanding yes. the dent. You need to sand the, the whole panel the with whole the long thing, yeah. blocks. And that, that the other day I saw, and I said this, I was with somebody, and I said, this is why you always need a long sanding block. And it was the guy sanding the side of of a Lincoln, like a restored like 1960s Lincoln Continental with the suicide doors. And he had a, a sanding block that was six or seven feet long. And he was sanding the whole side of the car with two arms. And the Goodness. sanding block was like four inches wide, but like six feet long across the doors and the body panels. Oof. and. There was a ton of bondo. I've never seen that. Tell. Yeah, but he was just trying to get the whole side of the car with this wow. one long shot. <laughs> it's like, uh, I don't remember what we were talking about, but a long time ago on this podcast, in, in episode 122, you mentioned something about putting sandpaper on the bottom of a big sheet of plywood and then just running that over over top of some panel. I don't know. I don't remember oh, what yeah. you were talking about, but uh, <laughs> that was one of your suggestions. Yeah, years ago, me and uh, I did all this. I did all this Corian countertop stuff, and there was a whole bunch of connections. There was all these joints, so we had to do end-to-end Corian with like edge banding Corian. I made this whole countertop, and I had to smooth this this intersection of all these panels. and And this is where I came up with that similar idea. I was with David Welder, and we took a piece of plywood, sanded a bunch of hundred grit panels, uh, glued a bunch of hundred grit. And we made this sled and piled weights on that sled. And just the two of us, I remember we, it was a hot day and we were both dripping sweat like coal miners, sliding this wooden sled back and forth over this joint to smooth it out. And that's what really got worked that whole joint down to get it smooth. That same type of thing. Hmm. That's pretty wild. Um, and how did that, did you then have to go back and polish that? Uh, the Corian, yeah. yeah. Then you just so that was really just to to break all the surfaces to get all the surfaces on yeah. you know coplanar, and then on top of that, then you go sand it with three hundred, four hundred, six hundred, twelve hundred, and then you could bring it up Gosh. to a gloss if you needed to. Mm. Yeah, a Corian is such a, an incredible material to play with if you haven't played with it. It's great for CNC, and you can laser etch it for making. I use it for la- leather stamps a lot, but it, when you glue it together with the proper color you can glue it together with the proper color epoxy the seam is it becomes invisible hmm cool that you know that's for if you're making a counter or kitchen or reception desk or something well we had a topic but we didn't really get to it and we've been talking for a long time so um we'll just save it Mm -hmm. that's cool next one um I will say, after we finish recording today, I am going to actually start the... I, I talked about it a couple weeks ago, like redoing my shop and the whole reorganization and everything that starts mm-hmm. today. Oh. I'm really excited nice. about it. Yeah. it's The the thing that I'm still kind of on the fence that we're trying to figure out is just the presentation of the thing, because I've got an idea. I've got kind of a... I don't, don't want to say system that oversells it a little bit, but, you know, like I'm I'm thinking through a a way to describe to myself what do I want out of this space and how do I achieve it? And then I'm trying to apply that little system to each of the spaces and the shop as a whole and then my office. And so I'm trying to make something that's like a, here's a little plan for organizing spaces for yourself. Three steps to think think about this and then think about this and then apply it to this and then do it again, you know. So um, just figuring out how to present that to in a video it's gonna be a lot of talking but 
I, I don't know. I'm, I'm still kind of, but the other side of it is I'm just really anxious to start throwing stuff away <laughs> <laughs> and like cleaning yeah. and organizing it's and like, so you know, get it. Let's, let's, yeah, let's move it along. Yeah. <clears throat> so when we get done today, that's what I'm doing, which is pretty cool. Um, let me thank our Patreon supporters and you guys can come up with something to share. I've got something pretty cool this week. Um, big thanks to everybody over at Patreon that supports thank the you. show. Thank we you, are thank very you. grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, we don't <clears throat> really talk about the specifics of it a lot, but we don't we don't take any sponsors on this show. We turn them down every once in a while. Um, we don't have to worry about They're algorithms. They're banging the door down, by the way, the sponsors. <laughs> banging the door now. We don't have to worry about algorithms feeding people this show. Uh, you know, like, we don't have to chase that or anything. And that's because of the support on Patreon. So it really does mean a lot uh, that everybody over there that helps us 100%. out at any level, it, it is... Very much appreciated. So thank you. Um, these people go top. Go the top supporters that go above and beyond are Nick Ryan, Corey Ward, Albers Woodworks, Works by Solo, Chad from Minecrafting, Chad's Custom Creations, Rich at Low and Design, Odin Leather Goods, Sean Beckner, Scott at Daddy Yourself DIY, Jeff at the new Janky Workshop, Warren Works, Michael Manegin, and Crabtree Creative. Now that yep. group of people has been there for a really long time. I think Nick Ryan is the newest one, but even he, he's been there for Nick was at my very first class we did here in 2016. Photography really? class. And he, he went to several subsequently, but his family started growing and he can't come as much. But wow. Nick, Nick knows I love him. Um, but that group of people, they, they do go above and beyond. And so big thanks to all of them. And I just but got also, several comments. I just got several comments from Jeff at New Janky Workshop, so thank you. <laughs> on oh, my other Patreon. Cool. Oh, <laughs> same here. I'm looking at some of the other people that I I don't normally mention, uh, you know, in in show notes and stuff, uh, like Jenny and Davis. Oh know. yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank big you thanks, guys. Big thanks to them for sticking around for since 2019. Wow. Wait. Yeah, 2019. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Crazy. Um, anyway, if you want to help out the show. We would appreciate it. You can go to patreon.com slash making it. Everybody gets the after show at every level. So if you want that, you can go to Patreon. And if you don't want that, you don't have to listen to it. You can still go to Patreon. That's up to you. But uh, you guys got anything to recommend this week? I got uh, Michael Jammin. Michael J-A-M-I-N. And Michael Jammin got popular on Instagram, and he also has a podcast, his podcast. But he's in California. And he's a screenwriter. He's written on several, several popular, famous shows. And he's, uh, he's got really good advice when it comes to the creative process of writing, mostly, specifically. But it applies to everything we do, one way or another. He's very open and honest and, and very transparent when it comes to writing for TV shows in Hollywood, specifically. But it's all applicable stuff to the creative process. Michael Jammin. His, his Instagram is very funny. He, he, like I said, he rose, his Instagram popped because of the writer strike. And he was given minute by minute updates about what was going on and why and how and all that stuff. And the actors in the writer strike. That's how I found him. Interesting. Cool. Mine is a YouTube video called A Map for My Inner Child. Have you guys seen this video? Have not. No. So this guy named Jordan Stuttered. He makes a map of New York City where he lives, and it's um, it's got a bunch of LED lights behind it. He took an old map, framed it. It's got a bunch of LED lights behind it, and each light represents like a a famous iconic place in New York seen on in, in movies and television shows, like the Seinfeld restaurant or uh, just cool. uh, there's there's like a couple dozen of these places within this map. And it's a really good video. And he's making this map throughout the video. It, it's, it's only three minutes and 10 seconds, so it's not going to take long to watch. Um, but it's not, it's a really good way to approach a video about making something and not have it be about making something. It's about the story of his childhood and, and, and making of them. It's just a very interesting way to make a video. You would think. How I would approach it is, well, I took, uh, I took this map, I made this frame, I wired up. You know, it's not about that. It's about the story, and it's just really good. Hmm. Cool. Let's check that out. 
Um, mine is from Corridor Crew, and it's a coincidence that it's Disney related completely. It just happened to show up for me yesterday. <clears throat> so this video is about a piece of technology that Disney came up with to make movies years ago, and they used it once or twice or something, and then it just like disappeared. And um, the short version of the idea is, you know, like green screen, blue screen. It's a it's a colored background that then when you make the movie, you can key out that color and replace it with something else. And this has been done for years and years and years. But when you look at um, Mary Poppins, there's a lot of problems with that too. You can't wear the color that's being keyed out. It doesn't work with transparent things because the transparency and the color behind it is really difficult, whatever. When you watch um, Mary Poppins, you have transparency, you have lots of motion, you have water, you have all these things that shouldn't work, and they look perfect. And so they went on this quest to kind of figure out how they did that, and it turned out that Disney came up with this whole process for a... a <laughs> Like a, I don't know what they call it. It's like a filter, but it filters out one very specific spectrum of light, and then they use that light color to light the background so that they can knock it out. And it's mm. all in camera, and it creates two separate pieces of film that they can replace. And it's it's wild, but they recreate this. And the chris the filter, it's not a crystal, but the filter or the whatever the thing is, a physical thing that they use to separate this light. There were, they made like three of them, and then nobody knows where they are. They just disappeared. Mm, wow. So Corridor recreates with this scientist guy. They recreate this thing to be able to do the same process now on footage, and they do a side-by-side -side between shooting this really complex thing on green screen, and then they shoot it with this method. It's really cool. Like this Stuff is like this is... Corridor, the guys that do the cool computer stuff? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I'll check it out. And so it's this weird intersection of, you know film work and making and they're always fun to watch anyway i uh, thought for so sure anyway, you good, were going I'd to mention the uh the disney the, the like the the ghost glass reflection thing that they were gonna uh it's in one of the imagine it's in that show that you were talking about and they oh. have uh how they would project ghosts this is is this making any sense to you yeah it, uh, and yeah, the I vaguely glass? remember like it. A, and like yeah. an angle glass? Ang yeah, That's like an old yeah magic angle trick. glass. So it looks like you have this like human sitting. So the chair's real. You look, you look, you, you see the chair, but then there's a piece of glass in front of you, angled just right, and there's some sort of image ref that's reflecting off of it, and you see this like transparent person sitting in this chair. Yeah, I do remember that. That's not what I was talking about, but that is also cool. Yeah. It's in that show that you you mentioned earlier. Yeah, the Imagineering yeah. thing. There's a lot of cool stuff like that, like in that in that series where they talk about how they came up with, um, like on Haunted Mansion, the little globe that has a a video of a like a head singing and stuff in it, like that. There's a whole name for that. Um, anyway, yeah, go check out the corridor nice. video. <clears throat> uh, you guys got anything else for this week? No, that's it. Cool. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Okay. We'll catch you, you next time. You, you got oh, it? Oh, I love you. Uh, yeah. Sorry. People wait for it.